All right, now we're on to another turn of the century literature author, Emma Lazarus. And the poem of hers we read this week is The New Colossus. All right, let's get into that. Um, if you look at the lecture there, the written out version, there is another photo. And this one is of Emma Lazarus. So we get to see how she looked and dressed. Uh, for the time, so that's kind of fun to see. Uh, I feel as if we're peering back, like as if we have a time machine and we can capture the moment a little bit by seeing what these authors look like. Um, the lecture also has websites um, with links to more biographical and literary information on Emma Lazarus in case you would like more. Um, there is a sound clip from National Public Radio, NPR. And it includes not only a reading of the Emma Lazarus poem, The New Colossus, which we're reading for class this week. And again, remember how great it is to listen to poems because they're written with oral characteristics in mind. So sound, rhyme, rhythm, alliteration, um, those characteristics come out and you appreciate um, that uh, phonic quality uh, more when you can actually hear it read. So that's fun. You might want to listen to it for that. But there's also an informative interview on Emma Lazarus with Esther Shore, a Lazarus biographer from Princeton University. Just, you know, uh, another great woman talking about another great woman. The NPR interview elaborates on the context. Oh, there's another one um, that elaborates on the context for which Emma Lazarus composed her poem, The New Colossus, to raise funds for the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. Yes, that is what the New Colossus is, the Statue of Liberty. So uh, no spoilers, but there you go. <laughs> um, and then there is a YouTube clip that features immigrants reading aloud Emma Lazarus's poem, The New Colossus, in front of the backdrop of its most famous publication, The Statue of Liberty. It's written there. So, yeah, kind of neat. So it's very moving, actually, to watch that. Uh, okay. Emma Lazarus, she is an American. She lived from 1849 till 1887, tragically only to the age of 38. Yeah, when she succumbed to what is thought to have been Hodgkin's disease. So Hodgkin's disease is a form of cancer that affects, I believe, the white blood cells in the body. Anyway, Emma was born to a large affluent Sephardic Jewish family in New York City. Her father had lived in America since colonial times. So, I mean, that sounds so long ago. I mean, not her father, her family. Her family had lived in America since colonial times. And that does seem so long ago, right? Um, so she herself was not an immigrant. Well educated by her family, she spoke several languages, um, unedited and translated poems from both German and Hebrew into English. Um, she wrote two plays and a novel in addition to her numerous poems. Her father published a collection of her poems when she was only 17. Yeah, kind of cool. He seems very supportive that he, he educated her well and he published her poems. Um, when she was 17. She gave the book of her poems to Ralph Waldo Emerson. Remember the famous transcendentalist that we talked about earlier with Margaret Fuller? She was in that circle of the transcendentalist and also Louisa May Alcott, whose father was in that circle. And so she herself also was, you know, associated with all of those people, especially when she lived in the commune and in Fruitlands. So anyway, it's the same Ralph Waldo Emerson, who's a transcendentalist, that famous transcendentalist movement that you'll actually You'll find in The Awakening when we read that too, um, the main character also associates or reads um, transcendental writings. Anyway, she gave the book to Ralph Waldo Emerson, you know, this famous transcendentalist author who took an interest in her writings. Pretty cool. Yeah. Well, after reading George Eliot's novel, Daniel Deronda, so remember George Eliot is actually a female author. She, her actual name is Mary Ann Evans, but she used the pseudonym, the male pseudonym of George Eliot. Um, authors often did that at the time because they wanted privacy and they also thought that having a male name on their books would help with the sales and also help with not, you know, having social 
stigma, right? Because again, still, even though more and more women were writing at this time period, there still was that social stigma and that pressure um, for women not to write. Um, you know, maybe they were looked down upon for writing or try to support themselves, things like that. And then also, you know, maybe there was a little bit more, oh, you'll be taken more seriously as a writer if you use that male pseudonym. So anyway, after Emma read George Eliot's Daniel Deronda, um, which is a book about um, a Jewish person too, um, she became even more sensitized to the Jewish plight, especially after Russian pogroms, such as attacks, sent Jewish immigrants to America. So Jews were fleeing to America to escape persecution in other countries. And I mean, we saw that all the way. I mean, Jews were expelled from countries for a lot, you know, I mean, this has gone on for hundreds of years that Jews were expelled from countries, you know, it happened in Spain, uh, happened in lots of countries and, or they were put in ghettos, you know, bad, like little areas, little small areas where they could live in towns and, um, had to live only there and do business according to certain rules and regulations. You know, they, they were very much um, denied civil rights. So, so she was sensitized to the plot of Jewish people in other countries and she herself was Jewish. And so um, she wanted to do something to help as a solution for these prejudices. She proposed the formation of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Now, that was an idea that was brought about by the Zionist movement, people wanting to relocate Jews to this area, you know, that had been traditionally associated with Jews, you know, in ancient times, right? This area of Palestine. And um, after World War II, you know, when, which saw the Holocaust and Jews being killed for their beliefs, you know, rounded up, not only put in ghettos, but put in concentration camps um, and extermination camps where literally they were exterminated. They were, they were killed as if, you know, they, well, denied all, all human rights, obviously, if you're being killed, right? So after that, after World War II ended and, and people saw the horrors of what were happening, of what was happening to Jewish people, um, that's when the push for the, the um, Jewish homeland actually result in reality and the nation of Israel was established and Jews went there. They relocated um, from many countries across Europe and even from the United States and around the world. Um, of course, that led to other problems, right? With people, the Palestinians were living in Palestine saying, hey, wait a second, you can't just take our land. We lived here. We've lived here for thousands of years. And then the Jews, you know, said, oh, well, we also lived here for thousands of years, but we branched out and now we're returning. So, you know, there has been that fight over that land, I mean, for thousands of years, and it continues to this day, right? Well, she supported this this concept of, of Palestine um, being a land reserved for the Jews where they could go and escape persecution, you know, the persecution that they're, they were encountering all over the world, and they could live in an area um, dedicated to, to the Jewish population, so escape persecution there. Kind of like when we had the pilgrims come to the United States, or wasn't the United States then, come to America to escape the persecution that they were um, experiencing in England and Europe. And so when they came here to establish themselves, um, and then obviously the colonies grew up. And so, you know, there were other problems there. Um, but anyway, that's what she supported um, as a solution to um, Jewish persecution. Um, interestingly, the poem of hers that we read for class, um, entitled The New Colossus, and it was, it was published in 1883. It's Emma's most famous work. Um, she deals with different people unwanted in their native countries. So instead of, you know, this being a poem about people returning, you know, to a land um, that can be dedicated to just the native population, she's talking about bringing in people who are unwanted in their, in their native country and bringing them into our country in the United States and welcoming them um, with open arms. And she poses for them a new homeland in an already existing country, the United States, instead of like taking a country and just like making it um, to welcome the population and dedicating it just to that immigrant publication, she would say, we want to take all immigrants here in the United States. This poem, of course, is inscribed on the pedestal 
of the Statue of Liberty. And you can go see it yourself. It's still there. It didn't go anywhere. Um, and that's in the New Jersey, New York Harbor, of course, where the Copper Lady, so I say copper because, believe it or not, that statue is made out of copper. But copper, over time, oxidizes and gets this green patina over it. And so that's why she looks green instead of the, bron the bronzy, brownish, orangish color of copper. But she did look like that originally. Um, anyway, uh, the Statue of Liberty was placed to welcome immigrants, the thousands, the myriads of immigrants who entered the United States, the port city of New York, uh, and symbolized that the welcoming open arms of the democratic United States to, to give your tired, your poor, your needy, those longing for, for a homeland, um, a place where they would be welcomed and where they could find work and uh, solace and hopefully civil rights, right? Well, from the, I mean, of course, you know, Nothing always works out exactly the way it was intended, but that that was the intent, right? Behind the Statue of Liberty, and it was a gift from France, um, and uh, you know, basically acknowledging, uh, you know, how we were this example to the world, our country, of um, having civil rights and welcoming populations and things like that. And um, of course, France and the United States had had this long history together from the time of. The American Revolution, where the French supported us in our um, revolt against uh, the British Empire. So, anyway, from the time of Emma's birth to her to the turn of the century, now the Jewish population alone increased from fifty thousand at the time of her birth to two million at the turn of the century. Unbelievable increase, right? Um, I don't know how many times over that increase, but a lot let's just say that it increased a lot so this shows you how much immigration was exploding at this time and of course we have ellis island at that time that was welcoming the immigrants in uh and the statue of liberty would be the thing that they would see as they would come into that new york new jersey harbor and then they would get off their boats at ellis island and you know be asked a series of questions and they were either granted acts you know entrance into the united states or they were denied and sent back, right? If they like had diseases and things like that, there were reasons that they wouldn't be allowed in. Also, they had to have like, you know, a place to go, you know, they couldn't just like come into the United States and just like live on the streets. They, they need to show, look, I have a way to support myself. I have people I'm gonna live with or a place to stay. Um, so I will be a contributing member of society. So this is a poem that very much taps into and captures that, um, immigrant spirit you know and the welcoming of those immigrants into the united states at a time of you know immigrant explosion right like we were welcoming people for all the burgeoning industries that we had here and you know it dovetails with the principles on which um, america was established right that we are this this welcoming home this new nation um where people can start over and have second chances and where we have supposedly equality and democracy so people can have that pursuit of the American dream, right? Where if you work hard enough, you can make ends meet and, and be happy. Yeah, so enjoy Emma Lazarus's life and the poem of hers we read, The New Colossus.